Hey everybody, Darren Goros here. Today I'm gonna sit down with Jazz Takar from the Real Estate Center, and Jazz is gonna walk us through all the ins and outs of buying a pre-construction condo. Pre-construction condos are a great way to stagger your investments, and they're also often purchased three to four years out from completion date, so it's a great forced savings plan for many investors. It can also be a great way to passively invest in real estate while you're waiting for that condo to be completed. Not all developers and sales teams selling pre-construction condos are created equal, so Jazz is gonna walk us through the pitfalls and what you're gonna wanna watch out for if and when you want to move forward with a purchase. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel. You can also hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Jazz, a good friend of mine and a, you know, a real estate expert when it comes to pre-construction condos. Jazz and his team do this all day, every day, and they are probably the foremost leaders in the country of transactions, both from dealing with builders and also dealing with buyers. So I wanted to have Jazz on. I wanted to pick his brain on what's the best way to buy a pre-construction condo. Jazz, thanks so much for being here. I will not try to give you too much more of an intro because I'd love to hear from you if you want to just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thanks again for joining me this morning. Thanks so much for having me, Darren. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the kind words. I've uh, been in the real estate business now for 15 years. I have a team of 25 realtors and 10 support staff with myself and my business partner. The name is REC Canada. We're under the umbrella of Royal LePage Signature. And about, I'm going to say, seven to eight years ago, we started to see a trend in, in Toronto where because of the Greenbelt legislation that was put into place in about, about 2005, builders can no longer, they, they couldn't build as many subdivisions because there was, the land was restricted. So the trend we started to see, and we all, anybody who's driven down the Gardner or the DVP, you see lots of buildings and lots of cranes. Where in the past, we found that it was big pension plans and big pension funds that were able to buy these uh, uh, buildings and rent them out. Now a regular investor could buy a condo and rent it out to a tenant. And that's when we've seen a big shift happen where investors were starting to, to, to look at pre-construction condos, meaning buying a condo before it even got built. And so now my team and I, and I'm proud to say, we still help buyers and sellers, like with a first time home buyer or like a smart size, they're thinking about downsizing or upsizing. That is about 700 people we help every single year, but out of which 250 invest into pre-construction condos. So we do a big number. We got a lot of data now. You know, if we just easy math, you're in five years, uh, you know, we're looking at a little over 1200 units where we've helped investors purchase uh, uh, pre-construction condos. There's definitely, you, you said it, there's definitely a right way to do it. And we'll talk about that. Uh, but this is coming from a place and this conversation is going to come from a place of, of a lot of data. Why is it so popular? Why do you like this uh, avenue of investing in pre-construction condos versus some of the other opportunities that are out there for investors? Yeah, for a couple of reasons. A, I think it's very popular because it's so passive. And, and what I mean by that is, is that for the first couple of years, from when you buy it to when it gets built, it's usually a two and a half to three year period. So you're not doing anything. What I'd like to do and why it's so high demand, A, because it's so passive, okay? The 20% as an investor that you need to put down, it's also paid out in installments. And so generally speaking, that 20% is paid out over that two and a half to three year period. So you'll put 5% down in 30 days, 5% down in six months, 5% maybe a year and a half, 5% in two and a half years when you actually get the keys. And so that makes it a forced savings plan for some people where you have to come up with that 5%. I think that's important because some people have trouble uh, with money. And when, you have a when you're forced to do it, you have no choice because you signed a contract. What is the qualification process for buying a pre-construction condo for financing? So if I go to the bank, when do they qualify me to, to purchase that unit? So that, that's actually one of the, the, the major reasons why I like it myself as well, because there's a formality from when you buy it. So let's say, say you buy a condo today, it's going to close and call it 2024 for argument's sake. Once you purchase something with a condominium uh, associated with it, you get a 10 day due diligence period. Essentially, you want to make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed with, with a real estate lawyer. Within that time period, the, 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 the builder is also looking for a pre-approval letter from your bank. 
okay? It really is just a formality. The pre-approval letter at this time, it really isn't worth much because look, the bank's gonna approve you in, for, for something that's gonna be built two and a half years from now. What they are looking for, the reason that the builder wants it though, is that they can check off the box so they can show their lender that, that, that Darren Voros is, is qualified from today so they can get, so the builder can get their construction financing. Right. But the actual mortgage is not needed until the building is built. I think because of this situation we're in right now with this current pandemic, what happens if when it comes time to close on my condo, I don't all of a sudden have a job and can't qualify for financing and I've purchased that, that, that unit. What happens then? What is the potential fallout or what can I do in order to avoid that situation? So right, we want to make sure that when we were speaking about the, that there's a right way to buy, there's incentives that we need to look at and clauses that we need to look at when we originally purchased this condo. And one of them being is the ability to assign the contract. It's called an assignment. And what that allows you to do is actually sell the condo, okay, before the building gets built. So if somebody bought something now, let's go T minus two and a half years ago, and they're closing on it today during the, the time that we're in right now, before we don't close on it and, and lose our deposits, we have options. We can assign it or we can do a joint venture. So I would say if I was in that situation, I'd call up Darren and say, Darren, I'm not able to uh, afford this uh, in terms of uh, getting a mortgage. Do you want to partner up with me? Like, do you have the ability to get financing? And why don't you, uh, you know, I'll give you 25% of the equity, whatever that number is, okay? Yeah. You might say, well, Jazz, I want a little bit more. That's part of negotiations between you and I. But I'm going to come to the table and say, look, Darren, I bought this three years ago. I bought it at you know, an average one bedroom in Toronto, three years ago, my clients would have picked something up for, uh, call it 400,000. I just did an assignment yesterday, like just yesterday, one bedroom condo, 500 square feet. They bought it for $400,000 and they just flipped it because they can't, they got to close on it in October. The wife actually lost her job. And, and so they sold it to another investor at 500,000. So $100,000 profit. But now what was in it for the new investor? The condo's value as of today, even while we're going through this time, it's worth 550,000. So the new investor was able to pick this up with equity, built in equity of $50,000 already. So there was, now the, the original purchaser had to leave that money on the table, but they still, it, it's a win-win. They made $100,000. They don't have to close on it. And the new purchaser has built in equity. There, it's really the only way that I have come across in the GTA to buy like under market value. I'm so curious about these stages of, of the sales cycle because <laughs> I see it all the time. I get notifications from, from uh, people inside of my network. It's like, we've got the exclusive VIP session and then we've got the family and friends VIP session. And so what are the stages? How do I get into the earlier stages? Because I'm guessing the earlier the stage, the better the pricing. Exactly. And the better the units, I'm sure not all units are created equal. What are the best units to be able to buy in a condo to see the highest value, highest return? When, when you're looking into purchasing a condo, you definitely, definitely want to buy at the earliest stage you possibly can. If, in, if any of my clients are buying even in the second stage, then I generally tell them not to because I've already seen the price list. I already knew what they were selling for in the first stage. So what do I mean by that? That within that um, two and a half year period, the builder is going to force the appreciation. We're going to have market appreciation. The market does what it does, but the builder also forces it. And what they do is, is that they come up with uh, uh, the first stage of pricing and I'll kind of go through each and every one of them. Uh, the first stage of pricing, which is to a select, select group of, of platinum, platinum brokers in a building that has 400 units. They're going to, that first allocation is the golden, like the platinum alloc allocation, because out of the 400 units, they're going to allocate approximately 50 units. And that's going to set the bar now. Those first 50 units are the best units from the, really from a price perspective, also from a range of floors. Okay. And there's different schools of thoughts. Do you go high? Do you go middle? Or do you go low? Me personally, I generally buy in the middle of a building because I know I want to, I'm always trying to cast the biggest net for my customer 
meeting my tenant. By, by going in the middle, I know there's people who don't like to go on higher floors, they're scared, or they just don't like the fact of being higher because of elevators and so on and so forth. Or people on, a, there's, there, there's tenants that I come across, I don't want to be on a lower floor. I like, I like walking up the stairs, right? Yeah. And so the value for me, dollar for, like bang for your buck, is also in the middle of kind of the building because you're not paying a premium for going higher up because builders will charge you that they'll charge you anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars per floor so i don't want to get involved into that because i also know a tenant generally doesn't care that you're on the 32nd floor opposed to the 18th floor so they're not going to pay you more rent from a dollar perspective yeah. so i want to pay a little bit less now going back to the pricing what happens is that 40 units, so to speak, that are 50 units in that first allocation, the, the builder is going to allow the, the, the original purchasers at that time to go through the 10-day due diligence period. They're going to see how many people actually went, went, went ahead with the contract and, and went firm on the contract. Then the next allocation that they let out now is to approximately three to 500 firms. They're going to let go another 50 units but it's gonna be a price increase. That's where that forced appreciation happens. I've seen, Darren, just from the first to the second, a difference of 40 to $60,000 per flow, uh, per unit. Like it's a quite significant jump. Then the third time, this is gonna happen about four times, guys. And so the third time, this might happen a little bit later now. Now it might happen two months later, okay? Now it gets to the public. That's when you'll start to see like a, you know, a big A-frame in front of the building. You'll start to see radio ads. You'll, you might see TV ads. You'll start to see a lot of stuff, obviously, in today's day and age on Facebook, Instagram. But now, in my opinion, as an investor, it's too late. If you see it in your Instagram feed, don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the best advice I can give you. If you see it in your Facebook, it's too late. There's been way too many increases. In all honesty, guys, just wait for another one. I personally get about 50 projects a year on my desk. I only promote 8 to 10. The reason I only do 8 to 10 is because I base my due diligence on three things. Location is the first thing. First and like, Location is going to determine everything else for me. Once once the location checks off, that's uh, right away I'll cut off, you know, out of the 50, I'm cutting off 15, 20 projects because I'm not, I'm not happy about the location. And the next thing is the builder. Who's building this thing, right? You know, workmanship. I mean, that stuff's important, right, Darren? Very, very important. Is it the first time at the rodeo? I don't want to be the guinea pig, nor do I want my clients to be the guinea pig. And then the third one is the incentives. Do I have the ability to do an assignment? And I, I want my clients to have an assignment clause really as a a parachute, a financial parachute, so to speak. In the example that we used earlier, in case they can't close on it, can they get out of the contract? A couple of other incentives really quickly is the ability, as an investor, the ability to lease it during the interim occupancy. What that means is when you purchase a pre-construction, the date on the occupancy might be you know, uh, 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 May 2024. But there's two stages to, to, to a pre-construction closing. There's the occupancy, and then there's the registration. That's when title actually gets transferred from one to uh, uh, ABC Builder to Darren Voros. In between that period, th that's called interim occupancy, where some builders won't allow you to rent it out. To an investor, that's important because you have to pay uh, still your maintenance fees and your condo fees in between that, like in that interim occupancy. So if you can't rent it, it's just sitting there vacant. It's losing you money. That period could be six to seven months. So we need to see it in writing that our clients can actually rent it out. And if we can, perfect, because now I'm renting it out actually at market rent and I'm only paying an occupancy fee. It's actually, we take what could be the most negative time of owning a, pre, a, a, a condo to turn it into a positive because you're going to see significant cash flow because you don't have a mortgage payment yet. Don't get used to it because once you get a mortgage payment, your, 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 your carrying costs are going to be higher. But we're essentially looking for, and that's why pre-construction condo investing is not for everyone, right? Um, because what we're looking for is where can the rental income cover my expenses? I don't want to have to pay out anything. I'm not looking for it personally as an investor and the thousands of our clients that did it. And again, it might not be right for somebody who's watching or listening now, but we're not looking for uh, 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 five, six, seven, eight hundred $800 a month in positive cash flow because I know it doesn't exist in GTA.
specifically like Toronto proper, but I'm okay with my rental income covering my expenses, my unit appreciating, and, and somebody else paying down my mortgage. And I'm probably looking at about a 28 to 32% return on my investment every single year, year over year. What are the fees? Um, I know there's some additional fees when it comes to buying pre-construction or buying new construction. Uh, explain a little bit about the development charges and the HST. So the development charges and the HST is paid, as I mentioned, remember there's two parts to a closing. There's occupancy, there's registration when title gets transferred. And so those are gonna be paid um, uh, at, at the transferring of title. The development charges, um, essentially it's uh, the city charges the developer and the developer passes that on to the purchaser. When we're doing the contract we want to make sure that we get it uh, as an amendment it's one of the other incentives as well that the development charges are going to be capped so if we buy today in 2020 we don't know what they're going to be in 2023 or 2024 we want to make sure that th those development charges are capped hst is 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 in ontario it's 13 percent is 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 our tax but on a new condo it works out as a formula of about 7.2 percent on the purchase price. But as an investor, if you show that you're renting out the condo, because you're paying it at registration, you're probably renting it out at occupancy, you'll have a lease agreement. You show that to the CRA, you, you attach it, it's a form that you get from their website, you show the lease agreement, and then you get a rebate back within four to six weeks. I've seen a lot of sales teams like yourself advertise things like uh, rental guarantees for you know a certain amount of time, years at a time, free property management. Are there any pitfalls to those kinds of arrangements? What should we know about in terms of those? Well, I would find out who's going to be managing it. Um, what is the rental guarantee based on? So let me give you an example. I have a project right now, actually, um, where it's a rental guarantee for a one bedroom, 700, call it 650 square feet. Uh, in the beach area. The rental guarantee I'm getting, okay, is for $3,200 for a one bedroom. This building's gonna be built in a year from now. So when I saw it, I was like, oh, that sounds high. What's going on here? And then they're, they're actually offering that rental guarantee for three years. Can I rent this out afterwards for that amount? Because if I can't, I'm gonna be stuck with something. Yeah, the builder gave me the rental guarantee. That's fantastic because even if it's not rented, the builder pays pays, gives me my 12 checks a year and, and, and that's all great. But when that guarantee is finished, am I at market rent? And so that's what I needed to look at. And if I look at in the area, I look at the size, I'm, I'm calculating what and forecasting what rents are going to be essentially in four years because it's a three-year rental guarantee and it's going to take a year for me to close on it. So in four years, am I confident that I'm going to be able to get that rent? And it was a no-brainer. The other thing that you want to look at is, is if, as I mentioned, that you want to make sure that who's managing it, who's going to be actually taking care of the builder. And so those are the, two, I apologize, taking care of the tenant. Those are the two main things when you're looking at those type of uh, guarantees and incentives. Any final thoughts you want to add, Jess? Make sure you work with an expert. That doesn't need to be our team. Or just make sure that they invest themselves. That's the question I always ask. Hey, are you an investor? Do you invest? Because if you're telling me to invest and you haven't, and you don't have uh, 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 the stomach for it, like how are you telling me to do it? So make sure they're an investor themselves. And that's just a quick question to ask. And, and you'll know. You'll know what, what by their answer. Yeah, great advice. Jazz, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to be here. People can reach out to you if they have any further questions. Um, and thanks again for, for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. Thanks, Jazz. Thanks, Dan. Have a great day. You too, my man. I hope you guys enjoyed the video today. I always learn something from Jazz, and I hope you did too. If you did enjoy it, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel. Feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and check out my website at darrenvoros.com. And with that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.